Hello, everyone, and welcome along to the first global panel of 2023, Would You Believe, brought to you by VLGA and LGIU, and we're delighted to have so many people with us for this evening's discussion and a terrific international panel to talk about financial sustainability and stability of the local government sector. I would like to uh, first start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from wherever you are joining us this evening. For me, I'm on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We uh, recognise and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd like to firstly call on Catherine Arndt, the CEO of the VLGA, for a couple of words of welcome. Catherine, hello. Hi there, Chris, and thank you for that introduction. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where we the lands where we are all meeting uh, this morning or this evening, wherever that might be. And it's fabulous to be able to um, kick off with the very first of our quarterly VLGA, LGIU Global Executive Panels for the year. Uh, we've, I think, three years into doing these now, approximately. It's all two and a half, something like that. And it is a, a great pleasure to partner with our colleagues at LGIU, um, and I'm very pleased and we'll introduce very shortly uh, the Managing Director of LGIU, Jonathan Carr West. But before that, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank all of you in the room for your attendance tonight. This is a really important topic for local governments globally. Uh, and I know in Australia, uh, and we'll hear more from our UK panellists, of course, but I know in Australia, talking with my CEO colleagues here, this is something, uh, financial sustainability, cost shifting amongst a variety of other uh, competing pressures is something that is keeping the sector awake at night. So thank you for joining us for the conversation. I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, as we go along tonight, please pop them in the chat function and uh, we will get to those uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, I will now hand back, well, actually, before I do that, let me introduce my colleague, Jonathan Carr West um, from LGIU based over in the UK. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, and yes, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for, for this really exciting session. Look, at LGIU, we believe that the most innovative and effective answers to some of the really big global challenges that we face are coming from local government all over the world. We see councils coming up with the innovation and the sort of systems change uh, that we need. But we also know that when you're in, when you're in the thick of it in local government, your, your head's down. It's really hard to, to find the time to connect with other colleagues in, in the local government community, particularly yeah, even within your own country, let alone looking at what people across the world uh, are doing. So that's what today is all about. It's about creating a forum in which we can bring together sort of practical insights and ideas from senior execs and local authority leaders all over the world. And as Catherine said, this is now the third year um, that we've been doing these sessions. So we're really pleased uh, to see you all here tonight. I'd particularly like to say uh, hello, good morning or good afternoon to our LGIU members who are joining us today. Um, it's good to see so many of you again. For those of you who, who are not part of LJU and don't know us, we're, we're the UK's biggest independent network for local government. Um, we've been going in the UK for 40 years, but we now operate in the Republic of Ireland, uh, in Scotland, in Australia, and we have more than 250 councils around the world who subscribe to our, to our services. Now, one of the things we do in bringing us on to tonight's topic, we're looking at local government finance. Now, we have been a major voice in research on English local government finance for, for many years. And since 2012, we've run an annual survey that, that tries to look at, get under the skin of what leaders in, in English local government feel about their financial situation, how sustainable they think it is, what they're having to do uh, to make, to make that, that budget balance. And yeah, we did that again this year. We released that, the, those findings back in March. And over those that decade, a pattern has emerged. And it's it's not a surprising um, pattern, but it's not a particularly encouraging one either. So this year, only 14% of senior council officials said that they were confident in the sustainability of local government finance. So we're talking tonight about local government financial sustainability in England when we asked council leaders, council chief execs, cabinet members for finance and chief finance officers, only 14% of them 
uh, are, are confident in the sustainability of the system. That's the lowest we've ever recorded in the 10 years of, of doing this survey. 8% of councils said that their finances left them at risk of essentially going bankrupt, which doesn't sound that, you know, well, 8% isn't that bad. But actually, if you, if you extrapolate that out, that would be about 30 councils in England would be at risk of actually sort of going, going under, putting really essential services at risk. 2023 has been a particularly difficult year, and I'd be interested to hear from, from panellists from across, you know, from Australia and, and other places about how this, how this resonates for them. Inflation, cost of living, recruiting staff, all of these were, were flagged up as major problems that was putting exceptional pressure on a system that was already weak. Uh, most of the councils we spoke to were, were pulling, you know, every lever they had to try and keep keep afloat. They were increasing local taxes. Council tax is, is the local taxation we have. That's going up as much as people, you know, the, almost every council in the country putting that up as much as they're able to. They're raising fees. They're spending their reserves. So more than half of councils, about 60% of councils are, are dipping into their reserves. And of that 60%, 80% of them so just over 50% of councils in total are dipping into their reserves year after year. So kind of definition of an unsustainable system. So the state of local government finance in England, and we have speakers here tonight from Scotland, from Ireland, from Australia, but in England, the state of local government finance is, is not good. And when I say not, not good is the type of cautious thing that, that we put in our sort of public service. I mean, it's utterly catastrophic. Right. It's it's on the brink of of, of complete failure. Oh, wow. But you know, it doesn't, doesn't help us to be, you know, we're a we're a we're a looking for to the future optimistic organization. So we we don't want to just be completely inward looking and pessimistic about that. So the next stage of our research is if England is in that sort of trouble, how does the rest of the world cope? So we've commissioned new new academic research into the financing of local governments in Japan, in Italy, Germany. And what we find is that very different systems where you know, they do things completely differently and that can help us to learn new and important lessons about how local government can get the resources it needs. And I think it shows us that research is coming out next month. And I think it, it, it really indicates how different you know, fin financing of local government sounds technical and dull, but actually the way you do that drives really different behaviours, really different outcomes. So that new research is going to look, get, take a really deep dive into some of those, those systems um in in other countries it's done in collaboration with the university of northumberland and the house of commons library it's an academic piece but we hope it's going to come out with real usable advice and we're going to be looking at how we can roll out that finance survey in ireland in scotland in australia so that we start to get some really co useful comparative learning uh, from other places all of those countries have their own unique experiences with local government finance all of them have different kind of stress points, different shapes of similar problems, but all of them also have different solutions. And, and so we're really keen to use our shared expertise so that we can try and improve local government financing in all of the places that we operate in. So I think to, tonight slash this morning's discussion is a really good contribution to that as we're going to hear a bit about how this, this, this looks in other places and what we can all learn from each other. And with that, I will hand back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. That's a little bit sobering, isn't it, to start our discussion tonight? I heard at least one uh, member of the audience say, oh, wow, when you talked about the catastrophic nature of things in uh, England at the moment, which is a timely reminder, too, to ask people. Uh, it's great to get the reaction to uh, make sure they're on mute uh, during the next part of the session. Uh, if you do have questions for any of our panellists, please use the chat function. Drop those questions in as we go, and we will have time, we hope, for uh, audience Q&A after we hear from each of our speakers tonight. Uh, I would like to uh, very quickly introduce each of our uh, panellists uh, before we get into the discussion. Firstly, I want to say hello to Darren Fuzzard, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Mount Alexander Shire in Victoria, Australia. Welcome, Darren. We have Sean O'Riordan, who is the Director of Public Policy Advisors Network in Ireland. Good evening or good morning to you. Good evening for us, uh, Sean. Kate Lackey, the Interim Chief Executive at Highland Council in Scotland. Hello, Kate. 
And uh, our first speaker is uh, Kerry Robinson, OAM Chief Executive Officer from Blacktown City Council in uh, Sydney, Australia. And we've been very pleased to have Kerry on one of our global panels in the past. And great to have you back, Kerry. Good evening Thank to you. you and welcome. We uh, look, you want a, a big growth area there in uh, yeah. Sydney. Lots of uh, challenges that most of our panelists uh, and uh, audience members uh, would not be surprised about. But we'd love to hear you talk a bit about what's the scene like for you at the moment and how are you coping with the types of issues that we've just heard Jonathan describe? Take it away, Kerry. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone online. Uh, it's great to be chatting with you. Um, I start, as always, by acknowledging the Durag people as the traditional custodians of the land on which Blacktown is situate. Um, Blacktown is the fourth largest council in Australia. Uh, we have a budget of about $811 million Australia. We're serving a population of 415,000, which is growing at a rate of eight to 10,000 people per annum. Across 54 suburbs, over 247 square kilometers, with a staff of about 2,200 staff. Our operating budget's about 485 million. Um, by way of background, I also have commercial roles. So I'm a director of a community housing association called Link Wentworth, which has about $200 million of assets and owns and manages about 6,400 homes. And I'm also deputy chairman of a local government insurance mutual called Civic Risk, which has 26 members uh, in Victoria and in New South Wales. And looks after about $9 billion worth of insured local government assets, about 8,000 local government vehicles, and our insurance buy is about $40 million annually. So for our overseas friends, perhaps a little bit of education. Um, the Australian Constitution does not refer to local government. So we are a creature of the states, and that's not necessarily uncommon around the world. Um, I give a lecture at the Uni of New South Wales each year to property developers, and I make the point that every country in the world, other than the Vatican City, has some form of local government. Um, so we're a creature of the six states and the Northern Territory with the ACT, which houses our capital, Canberra being an oddity where the territory government supplies municipal services to its 470 odd thousand population. And because of that, there's different legislation in all states. And so I'm in New South Wales, which is the most popular state in Australia, located on the eastern seaboard with and, and in the metropolitan fringe of Sydney, so literally at the urban growth boundary of the city. So all of the residual farmland within Blacktown in the next 20 to 30 years will be converted into housing and industry. We've got about 130,000 dwellings, about 25,000 businesses with a gross regional product of about $22 billion. So what's the financial position of councils in New South Wales? Not very good, folks, um, like other parts of Australia, but perhaps worse for reasons that I'll get to. Local government in New South Wales is not sustainable. There is billions of dollars currently of backlog in asset maintenance and renewal, and that is getting worse year on year. We've had two years of devastating bushfires followed by three La Nina years with very significant flood events. And the impact of both of those natural disaster events over five years has been very uneven across the state, across the 128 councils which make up New South Wales. So why the backlog, why the deficiency in OPEX, largely at the hands of the state government, which since 1977 has had rate capping. So we've had 46 years of the state government capping the total pool of funds that we are allowed to collect in rates. And in our growth area situation, rates are about a third of our revenue, fees and charges are about a third of our revenue and developer contributions make up the remaining third or a bit more. 
there is a, a, a way for us to apply for a rise in our rates above what the state says the cap is, which requires us to apply to the independent regulator, as is the case in Victoria, the other state which has rate capping. But the problem with that process is the community has come to understand that this, what the state government says is the reasonable level of rates. And if we are, as a council, asking for more, we must be incompetent and bad managers. And we must have poor political leadership. And there's nothing that the state has done to intervene in that public narrative. So the actuality of the rate capping over the, I just took the last five years, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index in Sydney has escalated about 17.4%, whereas the rate cap has increased by 11.2%. So that means we've had an effective cut of about 6.2% to our rateable revenue over those five years, which in our case equates to about $18 million. Interestingly, over that same five years, the state government's revenue has increased by 28.4%, more than two and a half times the increase in the rate cap. But it's actually worse than this, at least in the case of New South Wales, because Part of the local government funding regime in Australia is that the Commonwealth provides assistance grants to local government via the state governments. And for good policy reasons, the Commonwealth is shifting funds from the cities to the regions, to rural areas, because those rural councils don't have enough economy to tax in order to maintain their assets. But the consequence of that is that metropolitan councils are having a, re a reduction in our bags grants, as we call them. And in the case of Blacktown over the last 10 years, that's about a $16 million real reduction in our revenue. So things are not getting better in our regime in New South Wales. They are in fact getting worse. So just to pick on Blacktown Council's situation and give you a bit of a picture as to that, we've got a, a very severely constrained operating budget, but we have a lot of growth. And so we have a lot of revenue flowing in from developer contributions, which allows us to deliver about $4 billion worth of land and infrastructure to service the growth areas. So each year we spend about 100 to $150 million on land acquisitions and about two to $300 million of capex on delivery of roads, drains, open space, parkland and the like. We've also got a legacy of past councils leaving us capital. And they did that in the form of rural land, which they knew would eventually be zoned for urban purposes. And we've been using that to deliver about $275 million worth of capital projects by effectively running a development property business within the council, where we create about 100 to 150 residential lots a year, some industrial land, and have done other asset recycling. And so that's been instrumental in uh, significant development within our main CBD, where we built an underground car park, town plaza and flanking retail buildings. We're currently in a $100 million build for a centre of sports excellence within the city, in the largest sporting precinct in, in Sydney. Uh, we've just completed a $36 million animal rehoming facility. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Australian Catholic University to bring a university into Blacktown to change the character of the place and doing some other projects. A third element to our overall financial picture is that we've just sold the building that I'm speaking from right at the moment, which is the core of our operating facilities in Blacktown CBD. Uh, to Walker Corporation, which will do a billion dollar development within Blacktown CBD, delivering four and a half thousand jobs in the CBD across three new office towers. 
And in consequence, council is going to spend about, uh, about $175 million building two new office buildings in the next four years. And the last element of our capital position, which is positive on the capital side, is we've received $273 million worth of grant funding out of a slush fund that the state government created last year in the lead up to the state election, uh, which was called West Invest. And that will allow us over the next four years to deliver an Aboriginal cultural centre two indoor aquatic centres, two significant libraries and community centres, and a police citizens youth club within the city. But the report which council will consider next week to accept that $273 million has a problem in it. Because our operating budget is so constrained, we can't simply accept the grants because the implication to our operating budget for the depreciation, renewal, maintenance, operations of those facilities is, a capex, is an OPEX ask of about $30 million a year, which is a rate rise of about 10.4%. And so the councillors need to make that decision very consciously that they're very significantly worsening our operating budget position. So I haven't given you any solutions to the woes other than we'll be advocating to a new council following the election, local government election next year that we need to go forth with a very significant rate rise to um, pick up our operating position. Now, how much of a rate rise and how relatively important is that? The average rate in Blacktown is about $1,000 a year for a residential property. We have a sister city in called Porirua in the northern suburbs of Wellington in New Zealand. And I was there for Waiatangi Day on uh, February the 5th and asked what their average rate was. It's about three and a half thousand dollars a year, but it's worse than that because they're a water authority and the mm. bill is actually another $2,000 on top of that. Mm. So call it three and a half grand. I checked Auckland, Auckland City, which looks after about 2 million people, has an average rate of $3,500 residential rate. So whilst we'll be asking the good burgers of Blacktown to substantially raise the rate within Blacktown, in relative terms, our residential rates compared to other comparable places are not high. And that comes out of the suppression of the state government over the last 46 years. Hmm. Chris, I might leave it at that because I've probably spoken for too long. Uh, no, that's fine, Kerry. There was some really interesting stuff there. I will uh, let you have a rest. Uh, in, in terms of your gut feel for what your councillors will decide about that wicked problem of whether to accept that grant funding, understanding the impact it's going to have on your operational budget, what do you think they're going to do politically? 15% in the first year and 10% on industrial for the next two years. Right. And uh, the political scene has changed for you somewhat, hasn't it, given the recent state election? Yeah, so um, Blacktown in the western part of the city, an industrial part of the city, uh, an area of cheap housing on the fringe uh, with about 12% public housing has always been a blue ribbon labour area. Always too red to get money from a state labour government always too red for any blue state government to want to give us any money. But because of the growth and the, and the cost of housing now, meaning that anyone who buys a new house at the fringe of the city is relatively well off, certainly needs to have at least three times the average Australian income in order to afford a new house. That's overwhelmingly turning blue at the fringes of our city. And so we've now got two of the seven state seats within Blacktown or parts of uh, in being in Blacktown are marginal seats. Mm. And that has changed the equation very, very significantly. And more generally, at a Commonwealth level or a state level, Western Sydney, not only Blacktown, but the whole of Western Sydney, the two million people who live in Western Sydney, are very determinative of the outcomes of state and Commonwealth elections. And so we find ourselves in an 
unusual position of being slightly marginal and able to attract more grants. That, that's interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Kerry. Um, take a breath and we'll uh, no doubt come back to you uh, with some of our questioning. Um, I, I'm just curious, Jonathan, the red and the blue concept, does that hold in the UK in terms of Labor and Conservatives? Is it red and blue there? Uh, Conservatives are blue and, and Labor are red, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Is, or is that a political question about how local government funding is affected by uh, by by colour? It, it was really just making sure everyone understood the the, the significance of the red and the blue. But we can then come back. Then, we, that's not, then that's a much safer answer. Yes, yeah. but we can and come back to that if you if if you wish uh, later on. But I do want to bring uh, Sean O'Riordan in now. Sean is the director of the Public Policy Advisors Network in Ireland. He's one of Ireland's leading advisors to local and national government, and is currently contributing to several national policy developments, including the reform of local government. That is Sean's very colourful desktop while he brings up uh, a few slides that he's going to speak to uh, this evening. Um, Sean is the chairman of the Public Policy Advisors Network, which is the only full service policy advice resource for the government and foreign direct investment sector in Ireland. Sean, good evening and take it away. Uh, good evening, everybody. And indeed, good morning to my colleagues in the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm feeling slightly uh, uh, down at heel at the moment because there's nothing but good news from a local government point of view in Ireland. Uh, we don't do the red and blue, by the way. That's a completely alien concept here. Right. Um, we do uh, various shades of green. <laughs> but that's another story. So let's let's just get into uh, the uh, the um, issue in Ireland. Can, uh, can people see the screen there okay? Is that legible? Yes, yes, we can see it, Sean. Okay, so... Hopefully this works. So that's Ireland, uh, the sovereign state of Ireland, or otherwise described as the Republic of Ireland. There's a little bit uh, of land to the northeast, which is Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland is not part of Ireland. It's part of the United Kingdom. So uh, we've been confused by that for about 100 years, and we still haven't managed to sort it out in, in, in our shared heads across these islands. But Ireland is part of the European Union. It lives uh, in Euroland and uh, draws significant benefit from the fact that it lives in Euroland because it is one of the biggest exporters uh, at international level into places like Europe and the United States, and indeed increasingly into Australia and Asia generally. But you can see there that we have 31 local authorities. A lot of them are rural local, local authorities, relatively uh, low levels of industrial development. And then we have the powerhouses that are our cities, uh, Dublin City itself, uh, Greater Dublin is a population of about uh, 2 million people. So there are similarities with what Kerry has been saying, which we'll touch on in a moment. Uh, Dublin City is the largest authority with a population of uh, 588,000 people. And its budget uh, is in the order of uh, 1.6 billion euro for, uh, which is about what, 2.2 billion. Australian dollars uh, for operational issues on an annual basis and about 1 billion, 1.6 billion dollars for capital investment. And then we have the other cities. We, we, we'll talk about them in general terms, but that's just to give you a sense of, of the land. The current socioeconomic conditions here are very, very positive. Um, so the economy is the fastest growing economy and has been the fastest growing economy in the European Union uh, for the last uh, decade. This year, growth is expected to be in the order of 5.6% of GDP. Inflation is in the order of, a, it's just under, uh, uh, well, the, the core inflation rate is about 5.2%. It's expected to go down as low as 4.5% by the end of the year and then down to about 2.5% next year. Population growth uh, is uh, considerable and bring huge pressures in development terms uh, on in the Republic. About 20% of the population were born outside of Ireland, um, and that is in large part uh, influenced by the fact that we have such a big foreign direct investment sector here, but we also have an, uh, an even bigger, many people don't realise this, we have an even bigger Irish-owned foreign direct investment sector. So uh, Irish companies are among the biggest employers uh, of foreign direct investment that's going into the UK, for example, and indeed into the United States. Uh, Consequent on that is that our government, a bit like the uh, uh, government down in uh, in uh, New South Wales, uh, is sitting quite happily on very large surpluses. 
and in uh, in an effort to try and hide those surpluses uh, for the last couple of years, has been pushing all the money they could find into all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, accounts, uh, forecasting into the future in terms of purchase of defence equipment and so on. Um, and uh, that's not quite legal, uh, to be frank. So um, in the last uh, number of weeks, the government has come to a view that its existing foreign uh, sovereign investment fund will be up to considerably uh, using the surpluses that are available to them. Um, so we're going to see uh, significant investment into the foreign investment fund of Ireland, uh, not quite as big as Norway, uh, but you know, getting there. Um, certainly by 2030, there should be something in the order of 90 to 100 billion additional investment from surpluses on, 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 on the uh, government budget into the, uh, the foreign fund. That's on top of a 200 billion euro capital investment to 2030. And again, I, I, I'm beginning to draw parallels here with what, with, with what Kerry was saying. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, we have our local and European elections in May 2024, and we will have our national and presidential elections in 2025. And uh, as you'll all appreciate, elected representatives sitting on large amounts of cash uh, with elections in the, in the offing uh, that could be quite a, a dangerous period. Um, and again, I'll just make a quick reference to that in a moment. So our 31 local authorities are obliged to balance, to at least balance their books annually. In fact, most of them are currently running surpluses because uh, as part of the national policy uh, and indeed underpinned by European policy to address cost of living issues, government effectively has been subsidising uh, the increased costs being borne by local government and other parts of the public service here in terms of additional energy costs, etc. And there's also a hangover from uh, the uh, subsidy that the Exchequer put into uh, commercial rates uh, as a consequence of the pandemic, which has gradually been worked out and should be work completely worked out by the end of this year. But essentially, what it has done is that it has allowed local government to effectively collect 100% of their commercial rate costs, not necessarily from those liable for the rates, but from the National Exchequer over the last several years. And, and that has done wonders in terms of uh, um, allowing for the creation of, of significant reserves now by the local authority system, something which they traditionally wouldn't have had um, because of the nature of the, the financing system that we, we, we still grapple with. So about 65% of income is generated by uh, local government. There's a degree of variation there because, as I mentioned, we have large rural authorities and we have large urban authorities, uh, considerably larger than their counterparts in, on, on mainland Europe. Um, but uh, the, the rural authorities are more dependent upon go government subsidy uh, than obviously the case with the, the, the urban authorities. The urban authorities tend to be largely self-financing. And indeed, over the last number of years, uh, monies that might ordinarily have been retained by the uh, urban authorities have been used in part to subsidise uh, national investment in uh, uh, water services, for example, in our rural areas, uh, road of rural broad broadband, that sort of thing. But in essence, the local authorities, they generate about 65% uh, uh, of their own income uh, from uh, obviously charging for goods and services, commercial rates, uh, and local property taxes, and then they get about 35% in terms of day-to-day -day spending from uh, the exchequer. Uh, they also run very large capital investment programs. As I mentioned, Dublin spending about a billion a year at the moment. And even for Dublin, uh, they, they have access into uh, loan money from the likes of the European Investment Bank, the Council of Europe Bank, and so on, and, uh, and, and indeed um, private investment. Uh, but uh, they also would get quite a large subsidy towards capital investment from, from the National Exchequer, um, all of which is gratefully received, no doubt. Uh, but a bit like Kerry, there's a bit of a sting in the tail. So as a citizen in for Fingal County Council, I live just uh, where Dublin Airport is based. Um, so my annual, just again, this thing interestingly to, to what Kerry was saying, so I pay to Fingal County Council a property tax of 672 euro a year for uh, a five bedroom semi G beside the sea uh, in, a, in the rather salubrious village of, of Malahide, uh, surrounded by lots of civil servants as it happens. But uh, for that, I get over a thousand different um, services provided by Fingal County Council, ranging from the very big 
services like uh, provision of motorways, roads, uh, transportation services, and so on, through to individual uh, kids getting school meals in the local primary schools, and so, et cetera. So the local authority plays uh, not as, as, as extensive a role as would be the case on mainland Europe, uh, and indeed in parts of the UK, because social care uh, um, has been essentially nationalised and is addressed through a national agency to ensure universal service delivery across all citizens across the country as a means of, of trying to address the inequality of spending that would otherwise happen with uh, our rural authorities. So the the, uh, the the councils here play a very strong enabling role, um, and for that, as a the six hundred and seventy two euro goes into Fingal, along with the twenty five euro for the uh, the dog license, and that's what that's what we pay for everything. We get our water for free, we get our access to all the services of the council for free, other than the actual tax on property that we pay, which by the way is self declared, and um, so I have to look at the property values. Uh, every so often um, and get a reminder from Fingal to say, look at your property value and then uh, reassess myself uh, and uh, put in put in the um, the return. Just focusing in on, and this is where uh, the similarities with Kerry are, are, are quite marked. Um, so our local authorities uh, work to, uh, we, have, we have basically 18 government departments and essentially all 18 work in some form or other with the local government system. And uh, we have this uh, utterly idiotic regime supporting uh, local government finance through state government. In most other parts of the OECD, they actually have what are known as strange things called block grants. We don't do block grants here because our ministers like to be making announcements on at least a daily basis of a grant being given to a local authority for X, Y, and Z. So even yesterday, we had our Minister for Culture announcing grants of 10,000 euro for local authority museums so they could open in the evening. Um, and, and this is the plague that aff afflicts Ireland. So money itself is not an issue. It's the fact that there are so many schemes that have to be um, uh, addressed, business plans prepared, uh, justifications for spending for funds that can relate to very small amounts of money, like the 10,000 for the museums that announced yesterday, up to millions for motorways, uh, capital investment, uh, water services, etc. cetera. Uh, so a lot of local authority staff spend their time filling in forms. Uh, whereas in mainland Europe, it, you know, there, there is an, in, an ongoing multi-annual contract between local, federal, regional, and Nash, and and the individual municipalities in terms of uh, on, ongoing five-yearly programs. We're still plagued with the financial basis being on a yearly basis. Uh, so uh, the councillors and chief execs adopt an annual budget, and there's very little relationship with last year's annual budget and in, with next year's annual budget, and there's no sense of having security of supply in terms of income from the national exchequer in that context. They're subject to the individual grants being prepared and delivered by the local, by, the, by uh, the various ministries. Uh, the other problem with that, of course, is that a lot of that money is capital-based. So I mentioned the 200 billion investment fund that's been used at the moment to underpin rollout of, of um, transport uh, services, rail, road, et cetera, et cetera, schools, education, all of that sort of stuff. Well, all of those schemes are individually grant based. Uh, so it means that the local authority is having to apply for, if it wants to get money, it's free money in, at one level, in capital terms. If it wants to get money to build a tourism facility or build a road or uh, put in a, 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 a active travel, whatever, these are all subject to individual applications, which are in, in turn adjudicated by individual civil servants at national level, who then report to ministers who uh, spend their days basically making announcements. Uh, now, the problem with that is that people have just become so immune to these announcements that they actually really don't get any political benefit from it. You know, if they made just one big announcement every year, that would make sense. But no, no, um, we had a minister uh, wake up one morning there recently. She decided that she wanted to give 100,000 euro uh, to each local authority to buy flowers for the towns. Wonderful idea. But <laughs> the work that's required to do that. And then, of course, the really important issue, and going back to Kerry's point, is that yeah, it's exactly the same. You get all the money you want for capital investment. The actual money is being made available by the National Exchequer because of the ad hoc nature of the allocations uh, tend not to be uh, allocated to maintenance, to day-to-day -day running. Uh, so, so consequently, 
there are huge challenges of, you know, our politicians with 12 months out from an election going to turn around to a government and say, no, we're not going to take that 10 million to build X because we can't afford to run it. No, they're going to take the 10 million and do the thing and worry about the, the running costs in two years' time. And then beyond all of that, we have this huge pension deficit uh, potentially in the local government system that needs to be addressed. So to conclude, face value, local government in the short term, it's holding its own. In fact, you know, you, you could probably privatize it because it's making a profit if, if, if one was so ideologically bind it. Uh, but we are seeing a critical reduction in discretionary funding. So even though 65% of day-to-day -day spending is self-generated, essentially a lot of that now is going into maintenance because of capital allocations that have been, been previously provided. And that the flexibility because the ongoing capital investment is uh, reducing significantly. There's limited willingness to reform local finances uh, because the fear on the national politicians' perspective is that uh, it will result, surprise, surprise, in higher taxes. Uh, we have a lot of cost shifting going on from national government to local government. So when, when national government says, we've, we've come up with a new reform for local government, we're going, going to give you extra responsibility to do X, Y, and Z, and we've done a lot of that. And we've seen a 100% increase in the budgets that local authorities are, are, are getting from government in the last couple of years, but all capital. So all these wonderful news items going out there. But because of that maintenance issue, because of the problem with our pensions, uh, our, the medium term viability of local government is an issue. However, in saying all of that, under Section 29A of the Constitution of Ireland, local government is a recognised constitutional platform. And therefore, where local government to go belly up and go bankrupt, as Jonathan has been suggesting it may happen in England, the government would be obliged under the constitution to actually fill the gap. So it's a mugs game if they don't actually sit down and try and resolve the finance situation. But they're not going to try and solve the finance situation because it's too bloody difficult from a politician's point of view. With apologies to any politicians that are listening in to me this morning. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. There's a few mayors uh, in the room. Uh, I guess they'd consider themselves uh, politicians, but thank you. There's uh, more positives than negatives there, and a very serious question has come from the chat room already. Can we all move to Ireland? <laughs> we'll just let that one sit there and come. We'll perhaps go. <laughs> Let's come back to that. Yeah, let's come back to that. All right. Thank you, uh, Sean. Conscious, we do have two more speakers uh, to get to. And I want to uh, go across to Mount Alexander Shire in uh, in the middle of Victoria now, where Darren Fazard has been the Chief Executive Officer since 2016, I think. So um, a, a fair time there already and knows it back to front, of course, and the financial challenges uh, that that council is dealing with. Darren, good evening to you. And can you please set the scene for us on how things are for you in Mount Alexander Shire? Thanks very much, Chris, and great to be here with you, everybody. Uh, listening to Kerry, I think the only thing that Kerry and I have in common is that uh, we're both living in Australia and we both hate rate capping. I think <laughs> when you hear my description about our council's situation, it sounds nothing like Kerry's. So, yes, we are uh, a council in central Victoria in Australia, about an hour and a half due north of, of Melbourne, uh, for those who know where that is. Uh, we cover about 1,500 square kilometres of land, and that's that's actually fairly compact for a, a rural council in, in Victoria and even Australia. Our population is about 20,000 people, and we are a very popular place for uh, a very popular non-coastal uh, area for people to retire to. And the people who retire here tend to be pretty well off, highly educated, and uh, frankly are overachievers. Uh, and equally, uh, the people who tend to live here and still work here are also most of those things, and certainly most of them are overachievers. It seems uh, we've got more um, we've got more artists per capita uh, than most places in Australia, and we are internationally known for our hot rod sector. If you happen to be in the hot rod game, you probably know of Castlemaine, which is our our major town. Uh, we're also home to the largest food manufacturing business in Victoria, which is uh, Don K.R. Smallwoods, which uh, our English friends will know, uh, George Western Foods probably, who owns Don K.R. And we've got a lot of experts in the fields of environmental sustainability here as well. We're also the site of what's said to have been the richest shallow alluvial gold field in the world. 
and several of our towns really display the, the benefits of that wealth through the buildings that we still enjoy from the 1850s onwards. So coming with that, the heritage value that's placed on several of our towns is significant. And I appreciate mm. talking to people who've got thousands of years of, <laughs> of buildings, ages amongst you, uh, but it is a big part of our tourism identity here in Mount Alexander Shire. The community level, though, what all of that means is that we work in an environment where there's a pretty high expectation from our community about performance. Uh, and But what comes also with that is we have a community that's got significant talent, but it's also got a very strong desire to get involved and help out. And that's something that uh, I have to say, I've not seen it on this level uh, before in, in all of the places that I've been to. And it's in no part a, a small reason why our current Council's four-year plan has the vision of working together for a healthy, connected shire uh, because there's lots of opportunity in that. Despite that, though, uh, we have considerable financial sustainability challenges in, in that rate-capped environment that Kerry was talking about, the Victorian version starting in 2015. Uh, and just a couple of numbers for you that display that how that's affected us in that time. In 2015, we had an operating budget of only about $35 million, but... Within that, we had about one and a half million dollars worth of funds in the operating budget that weren't allocated to anything. So we could actually do things with that. Two years ago, that in a $40 million budget, that went to zero. The operating freedom was zero two years ago. And this year, the budget that we've just been working through for 23-24, we had to find about six to eight hundred thousand just to get us being able to pay for the bills that we get for just doing what we're currently doing. So that's on a, on a, a very poor trajectory from that point of view. Uh, that's obviously going to continue unless we can either do stop doing some of the things that we currently do. Everybody knows how challenging that is, finding new income, and I'll talk a little bit about that, or, or hopefully something changing as well in the rate capping system that we have here in Victoria, uh, not so different to what's happened in New South Wales. So a few things we're doing about that. For more than 11 years, my council, I've only been here for seven. It's been going for much longer than me. As a starting point in our budget processes, we've frozen operating budgets at the same level, so for 11 years, uh, and we've only committed increases on a case-by-case -case basis or where there's competitively tendered contracts that demand that that must happen or EBA agreements that demand that that increase must happen. So everybody must prove reasons for the operating budget increasing from the number that they got 11 years ago. In effect, what that means is most of our operating budgets are about 50% in real terms of what they were 11 years ago because of that compounding loss. So the last four years, we've been working on getting better though at attracting grants uh, from the state and the federal government. Initially, uh, we, like most rural councils that I know of in Victoria, uh, we didn't have grants officer capability at all, and a lot still don't. Uh, we put on one grants officer and we currently have two grants officers. What that's meant for us is additional grants being the ones that you have to apply for to get, not the ones that you get as of right. Uh, they increased from about 5% back in back when we started about four years ago to it's 18% of our budget now. So that's been a significant turnaround for us financially, recognising the points Kerry and Sean were making about substantially those relate to CapEx activities, not OPEX activities, but we have also been doing pretty well in OPEX as well. Last six years, we've been really pursuing agreements and MOUs with uh, various community groups and entities to take more advantage of that that generosity and capability that I mentioned earlier in our community. Uh, last count, we've got more than 50 MOUs or agreements in place across our organisation. And they've been uh, a lot, we found them to be a lot more efficient to administer than short term or project based agreements with different groups uh, and really have enabled more community needs to be met than we could ever do on our own. Uh, with relatively small contributions from council, substantially it's related to providing buildings or pr promoting things that are happening and other people funding the work that, that they need to do. Landcare is a really good example of that for us, but we do have a wide range of activities where we've been able to enter MOUs and, and agreements of sorts that have delivered services even beyond what council itself should be delivering, but we've been able to facilitate that for our community. We've long had special purpose reserves or piggy banks in place 
here. And uh, a good example of that for us has been our waste reserve that currently is serving us very well. We've had significant rehabilitation costs at our last landfill, I'm pleased to say, um, which was fully cash back funded by, by council. We've been able to accommodate continuous changes from the state government here in expectations about uh, waste and changes in waste strategy. Uh, and uh, we've, we've also been able to build up enough funds over time to be able to invest wholly into a significant resource recovery facility in the coming years. We've also had reserve funds that um, for specific other activities where we've wanted to save up over time with the community. And an example of that is a new indoor aquatic facility, which is a very big thing for a council of our size to take on, uh, but it's been a long held community desire. So we've been putting money away over time to put us in a position to be able to make the contribution we'll have to make to that. And importantly, one of the important things for us, which is a challenge in a lot of rural councils I know in this area is actually having cash, fully cash backed reserves not just saying you've got the reserves, actually having the cash behind them. And I think there was talk before about people having to get into their reserves by Jonathan. Um, we don't do that. We are fully cash backed and we maintain fully cash backed reserves religiously. And because of that, we're actually making quite a lot of money through uh, interest at the moment uh, on that cash. So that's that's actually been quite good for us. On the borrowing sides, we are like many Victorian councils from the state government's perspective. They see us as under leveraged. Uh, we uh, the reality though is the difference between us being under leveraged and us being leveraged to a point where people start to get concerned about us is about nine million dollars. So it's not a significant amount of money. And in our short term plans, and talking about only council contributions, we've got we need more money for that full project for council's contribution. We uh, we've got a five million dollar contribution to make to a premier sporting facility upgrade. We have five million dollars for a housing development that we're working on with private private developers um, and we've got uh, flood protection works that are significant contributions from council and as well as the ever present risk of having a superannuation guarantee call uh, which is um, quite common around here unfortunately and usually costs us a million dollars or more so nine million dollars is not much uh, when you think about all of those things so that advice from the state government that we get to invest and leverage more sorry to leverage our our borrowing capacity more is um, something we've rushed pretty slowly, I'd have to say. Uh, from a renewal respect perspective, that's an area where we continue to really test strongly the assumptions that go into those asset management plans. Uh, for rural councils, uh, and many of you, I'm sure, the biggest asset is roads and road-related infrastructure, and the assumptions that go into the plans related to those can be wide-ranging, and they have significant impacts on the bottom line uh, so we, we challenge those quite strongly and uh, getting realistic numbers in there or numbers that we believe we can accept um, is a significant change just in, the, in the, the numbers that we look at at the bottom line. Um, like many other councils, blowouts in construction costs and delivery timelines, we've seen a fair bit of that as well. But most of us for us has been in timelines being missed because of uh, the approach that we've adopted, which is... Uh, We've said that if the market is not responding in a fairish way with reasonable prices, all things uh, given, then and that's compared back to our engineers' estimates about what should have been an appropriate price, uh, we don't award the contracts. And uh, we've looked at ways to either repackage the work either partly or wholly. What, to what extent can we do more of the work ourselves or just to say to them, the marketplace, we are not paying that and we'll advertise again which we've done in a couple of cases, and it's actually been uh, quite beneficial that we've done that, I will say. Um, but I do know that that's not necessarily what's happening everywhere, and a, and a nearby council in trying to manage that, I know that they are talking to their councillors on a monthly basis about what are still your priorities for capital works for this coming year and knocking them off one by one as they learn the prices for the ones that, that were the next priority. So um, understand everybody's doing that in different ways. Uh, so it's not something that we've taken on that approach as yet. Uh, from the perspective of dealing with mounting need to generate new sources of income, we're, we're having a look at investigating opportunities to source more of those works um, in areas where there are thin markets and therefore we are paying or could be paying too high prices or the delivery timelines are poor um, or unacceptable. Um, specifically, we're looking at 
building up some of our areas in relation to constructing more things for ourselves. Um, more broadly, though, we're, we're really seeing an opportunity to, to grow some of our service areas, such as town planning, possibly other technical areas, engineering and the like, such that we can address the needs of surrounding councils through profit-making businesses. We're, we're just getting into that quite seriously at the moment and or as part of making our own work opportunity more attractive for people who to um, come and work with us. So potential employees offering a more uh, interesting range of uh, work to do. Um, we're also exploring new business opportunities to respond to some of the needs that are in our community that for one reason or another are not being adequately, adequately met. And childcare is one of those examples and really testing to see if there's a, if there's a way that we can get the funding we need to make that a profit-making opportunity, which of itself I know is not straightforward. Uh, recent months, we've also been in insourcing the management of our landfills and transfer stations as part of a longer-term strategy to do not only do better in our, in our recovery and recycling performance, but it's actually to intervene in the waste stream at a point where we can actually affect what happens and therefore... Um, be able to choose different paths that might be more cost effective for us. The moment we're fully outsourced on that process and we just pay and we, we can't influence how things are done after that point of taking the rubbish away from the curbside. So uh, we're hoping that that's going to not only be a potential profit business when we start getting into the resource recovery side of things, but also to reduce costs of the operating budget by being able to do things a little bit differently through intervention. Uh, Darren, can I can I get you to wrap up because uh, time wise, there's a few things we could dig into there. But if you yes. could just sort of make some concluding comments, yeah, I really thank you, Chris. I was about to do that. Um, so <laughs> I think one of the really important things that's um, happened for us in the openness of our council is in a small council area to think about actually expanding into business rather than contracting and being overcome by it has been a lot of the work that we did with them about our risk management framework and the amount of time we spent on positive risk, pursuing positive risk rather than just worrying about negative risk. So we've developed risk appetite statements with the councils that has got a strong commitment to say, go after good business opportunities. We want you to do that. And we get, we're seeing that support for that coming through our budget processes because the councillors have committed to doing that. So I'll stop there, Chris. Thank you very much, Darren. That, now, that's fascinating. There's a few things there I wouldn't be surprised that people would want to explore a little bit further, but that'll depend on time. And we do have one more uh, speaker. So thank you, Darren. And I do want to now introduce Kate Lackey, who's the Interim Chief Executive at Highland Council in Scotland, a long track record in public service, having worked in uh, Northern Ireland and has been at Highland Council, I think, for about 20 years in various roles, um, ascending to Interim Chief Executive at uh, this point in time. Kate's going to share her screen and work through a few slides uh, with us. Hopefully this uh, technology you will all work perfectly. And Kate, um, it's over to you. We'll just wait to get these uh, slides up. And while Kate's doing that, can I just remind folks, uh, if you've got your questions, please pop them into the chat. Now would be a great time to do that. Uh, if you've got any burning questions, we do want to make sure we know that they're there so that we can uh, allow the time to get to them. We can see your slides, Kate. So uh, lovely to hear from you now. Fantastic. Hopefully you can hear me too. We can. Super. Okay, I'm going to share my uh, screen. So I'll try not to take too long over this because I know we want to give time for uh, comment. But uh, so my first slide really is to, if my slides will move on, which they're not doing at the moment, bear with me a second. I'm just going to show it this way. Can you see my second slide now? Yes, we can, yeah. Kate. So um, Highland Council, there are 32 councils in, in uh, Scotland. Highland Council is the largest of the 32. And this slide is really just to demonstrate how big we are in comparison to the rest of the United Kingdom. We are roughly the, we are larger than Wales. We are roughly the size of Belgium. We're a significant, significant proportion of, of the Scottish land mass. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, a mixture of urban with the city of Inverness rural, semi-rural and remote um, and island uh, uh, areas. So 
Um, a kind of facts on a page, the things I probably want to pick out are we, our population is only 238,000. So with that land mass, that's only a, a, a very small um, population by density. We have a net growth of 2.2%, which is very positive. But what that does is it masks the fact that um, in some parts of Highland, we're actually forecasting a 16% reduction. So it's looking like, uh, for example, in Caithness and North Sutherland, we're looking at between 12 to 16% net population reduction. The other thing I would say about our, so I'm not sure that my, am I still sharing? That's okay. I'm not sure yes. in terms of um, the, Number of schools we have, we have 199 schools, 29 of those are secondary schools. Um, we've got over 40% of our schools have less than 50 pupils. So this is the, where we have you know, real remote and rural areas. Some of our schools have less than 10 pupils because they're on an island community, for example. Um, but our high schools in Inverness are over a thousand. So there's a huge range in the types of service delivery that we've got. We've got um, a significant number of roads, significant number of bridges and marine facilities. Uh, we've got the, the, uh, a third of the coastal um, uh, uh, coastline of Scotland as well. And 14,800 council houses, that's social housing that the council also provides. Uh, we are a coalition of um, independent members and SNP, that Scottish National Party. We don't tend to do red and blue in, in Scotland. It tends to be... Um, independent or not independent um, largely and but we do have quite a sizable opposition as well and a very active opposition so it's quite an active political scene in Highland. In terms of how we spend our budget a significant proportion is on schools that's not children's services that is education um, and a significant amount of that spending is ring fenced i.e we are required to spend it in certain ways. Um, we've then got adult social care and our third highest area of spend is what we spend on servicing our debt. So what we spend on, on, on borrowing money um, is a significant part of, of what we then spend in our revenue budget. You'll also see a whole range of services here. We do do the full gamut of children's services. So we do do um, social care uh, and social work for children. We also um, do adult social care, which we commission from the uh, National Health Service. And then we do waste and roads. We have um, our culture and leisure services are an um, arms length organisation delivered by a company called High Life Highland. So we do deliver a whole range of local services, um, including, as I say, social housing. So the background budget factors for us, 80% of our budget is actually provided by the Scottish Government. And that's the same for all local authorities. So uh, local authorities uh, have an um, umbrella body called COSLA, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. And the Scottish Government provides Scottish local authority funding to COSLA, and then COSLA then uh, um, apply a funding formula that then distributes that to the 32 local authorities. 20% of our budget is council tax. So that's the only tax that we can raise locally at the moment. That's the only one that is at our, our own um, hand and a 1% increase in council tax is equivalent to about 1.3 million, which is not a significant amount when you consider that our, our total budget, so I'll go back into here, our total budget, 6.79 million. So 1.3 for every percentage of council tax isn't a significant increase, um, but it does have potentially quite significant impact on our local residents. And then there's a whole range of ad hoc grants. And it's been interesting to hear other people talk about that, the, the ad hocery of the grant giving of, local, uh, of central government. And we suffer from that as well. Um, in terms of how our budget is split, um, almost half is staff. Um, and the, the, re the remainder is what I tend to call stuff. Um, but that shows that if, if we're reducing what we spend, a significant impact is on our staffing. And we are a, a, a major employer in the Highlands uh, area. So if we reduce our staffing, it actually has quite an impact, a, quite a, a major social impact in terms of employment in the area. Um, we make around about 202 million on other types of income. So that would be things like uh, car park charges, um, and developer contributions and so on. So that gives us our 668 net position. This, uh, this year, we've had a budget gap of around about 49 million pounds, so roughly 7%. Um, 
that's been caused by a range of factors. Now, the external factors, Brexit, which we are still feeling the impact of, primarily due to the um, immigration impacts, uh, which mean that our workforce is, is significantly reduced and our flexibility around workforce across the Highlands has been majorly impacted. Uh, it also uh, has uh, uh, implications in terms of the cost of importation and exportation. Ukraine has had a, a, a major impact in terms of inflationary costs. We're still uh, uh, you know, affected by recovery from the pandemic. And as you may have heard in, in the UK generally, um, uh, reflected in Scotland equally, is what we're terming the cost of living crisis. So the pay awards pressure for this year, uh, 19 million of our 49 point million is, is through pay awards and pay is nationally negotiated. So again, as a council, we have no control over what our pay award is going to be, but we do need to budget for it because it's not provided for in our grant. It's, it's part of our block grant. So as I say, 19 million is pay. Well, 33 million is inf inflationary costs on what we currently spend. 9 million of that is um, the cost of our energy. So use of utilities, primarily um, electricity. So that's, you know, that's in addition to what we already budget for in terms of energy. So that's 9 million. 8 million, believe it or not, is bus contracts, the contracts that we have with our bus providers to provide the public uh, um, transport that we provide, which is not um, universal. It's not universal public transport. We need to provide transport to get young people to school. Um, so that's costing us 8 million pounds more this year than it cost us last year. Um, and, and so on. So there's a variety of other kind of inflationary pressures and, and certainly in terms of cost of construction, um, our schools are costing us in the region of 40% more to build than they were five years ago. So an average um, high school costs us around about um, 90 million pounds to build. Uh, part of that cost is because um, we have to bring people into Highlands to build them and then they add a significant um, uh, additional cost on top of that because it costs them more to build where we are. Um, rising interest rates also um, affect us because of our loans charges. As I say, we're roughly £60 million worth every year in our loans recharging, uh, charges repayment. And so any increase in interest rates has a knock-on effect there. And then, of course, we have rising service demand and the cost of living crisis and pandemic recovery have all um, led to increases in service demand. New government commitments and ring fencing add to our woes, uh, where, um, where we might look as if we're having an increase in our um, grant from Scottish government. It isn't really, because we, we get provided with additional money to do additional things. And then we don't get the rate of inflation increase year on year. So we might get 10 million to do um, a whizzy new thing, um, which is fully costed for the year one. The next year, it costs us another million pounds more to, to deliver it, but we still get the 10 million pounds. So effectively, we're, we're in, in increasing our overheads year on year. And also, it's this over um, focus on inputs. So the Scottish Government uh, require us to provide a huge amount of data on what we're spending and how we're spending the money they give us. There's less focus on outputs and outcomes um, and impact. So uh, an example of that is we are required to maintain our teacher numbers at an absolute number whether or not we have falling school roles. So in large parts of Highland, we have sc falling school roles. As I say, in Caithness and Sutherland, we have a 16% reduction predicted in our population. That is reflected, uh, is, is over um, reflected in the younger population because we have an aging demographic, and yet we have to maintain our teacher numbers at absolute, uh, absolute levels. So all of that combined with the uncertainty and risk in terms of what's going to happen in the future, because inflation doesn't seem like it's got any chance of reducing, interest rates continue to, continue to increase, the war in Ukraine, um, so it shows no sign of, of um, slowing anytime soon, has resulted in this £50 million budget gap that we have in Highland. So what was our budget strategy then for closing that gap? We titled Reduce, Remove, Redesign, £22.2 .2 million. Um, some of that if I'm honest, it's just service reduction, cuts in, in normal language. But some of that was very much about redesign, trying to change the way in which we do things, trying to invest in, in uh, early intervention so that the more costly um, intervention at later um, uh, levels is reduced. So there's some genuine redesign in there. Um, increasing income, and that included a 4% council tax increase. That council tax is our local income generating opportunities. 
it was pegged to 4% because our local members, our elected members, um, bearing in mind the cost of living crisis, did not want to raise it any further. But um, other local authorities in Scotland, the highest increase was 10%. So there is flexibility there for local government. Um, so if you were in Orkney Islands Council, you've got a 10% increase, um, but with us it was 4%. And, and our um, council tax, our average council tax is about 1,300 1, per month. It's quite a lot, of that's pounds. Um, so that's quite significant. And so you can understand why local members maybe felt that increasing council tax any further, given um, the cost of living crisis was, was not, um, not supportable. So we weren't actually able, for the first time in my memory of working in the council, able to close our budget by sustainable means. We had to use 23.3 million from our reserves to close the budget. And as you'll all know, reserves can only be spent once. And so that effectively is pushing, it's kicking the can down the road. We've got 23.3 million pounds worth that we still need to find. And we're predicting at least a 20 million pound budget gap next year. So effectively we're pushing a 43.3 million pound budget gap into, into the following financial year. So when we set the budget in March this year, our chief financial, financial officer with my blessing um, put in his report that the council in its current form and model of service delivery is not financially sustainable over the medium term. And I think it was really important to be upfront about that and not to pretend that it was gonna be an easy job to get us back to a sustainable position. On the plus side, we did invest. So we have got some areas of investment. Our roads investment was 14 million on top of a base budget of 7.2 million to bring it up to as close to 20 million as possible. Um, that's because our roads are in a shocking state of disrepair uh, because it's a huge road network and a lot of our smaller roads, our, our um, C roads and our unclassified roads were never built for the level of traffic that they now get. And so they're dis disintegrating at a significant rate. We're probably out of 32 local authorities, we're sitting at around about the 27th out of 32 in terms of our road condition survey. Um, uh, I'm surprised we're not worse, if I'm honest, but um, it's, it's helpful not to be in the bottom 31 or 32. Um, treatment and reducing waste, we've invested, uh, we, we, we were successful in getting 6.5 million um, grant from the Scottish Government, to which we are also adding 1.3 million uh, in terms of treating and reducing our waste. And that's a spend to save approach because the cost of putting waste to landfill um, has a tax attached to it. And we really need to reduce that as much as possible. Um, quite apart from needing to meet our net zero targets, which are um, a, a massive challenge. And I'm interested because no one's really talked so far about the requirements for reaching net zero. Um, but I do feel as a local government organization, the, the responsibility has been pushed to us to deliver net zero, um, and I don't actually think it's something that individual local authorities are able to do. It has to be um, national and global, I think, to try and suggest that reaching net zero on a local level um, is, is, is achievable. I, I, you know, we have to play our part, but I don't think we can be given the lead. Um, and then investing in vulnerable young people and families, and that was investing in fostering and adoption and increasing the rates that we pay to local foster carers and adopters to uh, bring more young people back into Highland, which is less expensive, but also far better in terms of outcomes. And then finally, half a million pounds investment in our customer contact, in, uh, a project called My Council to improve the way in which we engage with our local population, because um, I think that being able to engage more successfully with the with communities and, and individuals enables us to deliver services that are much more reflective of what they need. Um, and also to understand where service failure exists and to address that at the point at which you can do it at least cost. Um, so in terms of the reduce, remove and redesign, just a quick um, scat, uh, canter through some of the things that we're doing to try and reduce our costs. So there's income, in, increasing income, looking at new income generating opportunities and um, optimising existing income streams. So existing income streams, that's fees and charges, that comes, that, that hits our local population but that is mainly for things which aren't, are discretionary, so people don't have to have um, access to. So that's not council tax, it's kind of all the other things. Um, we don't get to keep non-domestic rates um, or business rates, they get uh, collected by us, but they get put back to Scottish government, and then Scottish government give it back to local authorities as part of the grant. So business rates are not an area that we can go to in terms of income generation. 
We are looking at energy and renewable energy in particular as an area of, of, of real focus. I think that provides us with real opportunities, but there are difficulties with us connecting to the national power grid. And that um, that is dev not devolved to Scottish, uh, to, to Scotland, that's still a UK um, reserved matter. So we're engaging with this, the UK government on how we can engage um, with them on uh, uh, accessing the grid and being able to generate our own energy and sell it back as well as use it ourselves. As I say, there was efficient, efficiency improvement um, approaches, asset management, as you can imagine in an organization our size, it was originally eight local authorities, which in 1996 was brought together as a single unitary authority. We have thousands of assets in, in the organization and um, hundreds, literally hundreds of buildings, not including our schools. So that comes as, at a huge overhead to us. And as one of my colleagues mentioned today, um, equally, we have a backlog of um, care and maintenance for those, which we can ill afford. So um, we need to reduce our costs by reducing our assets. Um, contract management, uh, in some cases where we can't reduce our contracts, we've just decided to, to do direct delivery ourselves. So the bus contracts has led us to um, investing in our own bus service now in certain areas because we simply can't bring the cost of those contracts down. And we're potentially looking at delivering our own bus company um, for uh, significant parts of Highland where the market simply fails and we have single providers who effectively have us over a barrel. Um, a reserves review, so we look at all our earmarked reserves and see what can be freed up, but reserves are only one-offs. And then our people strategy, looking at how we can be more flexible about how we use our workforce across the organisation and moving people to where we know we need them and away from areas where we're going to have to reduce. So Kate, we're probably out of time. Yeah. I just wonder if you just want to wrap up quickly because we do I have some indeed. questions. I'm going to skip to the end. Thank so you. one thing I was going to say is that the, the Scottish Government have said they want a new deal with local government. Um, and the Accounts Commission and, and Audit Scotland published a report yesterday which talks about the importance of that new deal because um, there isn't enough money in local government to de deliver the services that we need to, and there's too much control from the Scottish Government to local government to enable us to deliver services that are locally responsive and really reflect the local needs, which are very different in an area like Highland to how they would be in Edinburgh or Glasgow, for example. That provides real scope for us, I think. And then the last thing I would say is, is um, the tourism visitor levy, we, that's the, 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 our real ray of light in Highland, because um, we have 9.6 million day visits um, 11.5 million nights of um, tourist visitors coming into Highland that we get no funding for, additional funding for at all. Wow. Um, so the transient visitor levy, as it's called, or tourist tax for us, provides a huge opportunity, I think, because, you know, we're funded for our tiny population and we're not funded for the millions that come to us on a, on a daily and annual basis so that for us is, is, a, is a, and so I'd be interested to hear where others may um, have a tourist levy in place and the pros and cons of doing so. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much Kate that's uh, a really interesting picture you've painted there and I think across all of our presentations there's been some similarities there's been some differences there's been a little bit of envy for Ireland, uh, I think I've heard cost shifting come up in a various form in everybody's presentation uh, this evening um, and a few innovative ways of dealing with some of this. I'm not sure we've nailed down the solutions that everyone could uh, apply, um, but we might sort of ask you to nominate one or two things that you think could be done perhaps to address the longer term sustainability of the sector before we wrap up. But Catherine, how are we going for audience q and I think people have been absolutely ensconced in those presentations and haven't really thought to this point. <laughs> absolutely, I agree, Chris. I think everyone's just been listening intently, but Rebecca, uh, Mackenzie's actually asked a question in the chat, which I actually was going to ask Darren, but um, really it's about understanding how involved the community's been and, and how receptive or what was their reaction, I think, to some of those hard or, I guess, slightly left of centre or right of centre decisions that councils have made that might not be considered necessarily core business. Um, so, Darren, I think you talked about um, identifying positive risk I was interested not only in how the community has responded to some of those initiatives, but also how receptive was the councillor group when you first put that to them? Sure. So the 
The positive risk side of things with our, uh, our risk management framework is something that we worked on with them probably about three years ago and have been talking about that. What's the opportunity from that for a long time? We've got a number of business people, quite successful business people who are our counsellors, um, and they they were very interested to explore that idea from their own perspective anyway. So I think we were we were lucky in a lot of ways that we had people who got what it was we, we were trying to achieve through through looking at positive risk and aggressively pursuing uh, business opportunities. Um, that said, one of the strongest things that's come out of that that process at the moment that came from the community was us getting involved in the in the housing sector. Um, uh, Kerry's talked about significant housing developments that they've been able to do. It's not something you would ever see uh, rural council, local government get involved in in Victoria, in my experience. Um, but we we have heard, and our councillors who are very deeply entrenched, we've only got 20,000 people, and I'd say probably 19,000 people know who our seven councillors are, and probably myself as well. They, they have direct relationships with those people and they were getting strong messages about what matters to our community and housing was, um, we know it's everywhere. Our community was saying, not only do we want uh, to see something done about it, we want to see council do something directly about it. So they got a really strong uh, approval to pursue getting into directly providing housing in a way that we and most other rural councils never have before. So uh, we spent a lot of time talking to the community about that as well and getting very specific about, so is this what would be okay? Here's a proposition we have. What do you think of that? And um, we actually got 82% of the community who responded to that, which is, uh, and it was a large response, said, you're on the right, you're on the right track, get into it. So um, that's one of the examples that we've put to the community really pursuing positive risk from the council's perspective. Thanks, Darren, for that. Rebecca, were, were there any other elements of that question that you asked that, that you wanted to speak to? Just Thanks, to put you Catherine. on the spot, sorry. That's, that's all right. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I was interested in understanding if anybody used sort of deliberative um, engagement processes or that sort of stuff, you know, to what extent were some of the initiatives actually potentially led by the community? Anyone here, uh, Kate, perhaps? Yeah, and the community engagement is a really critical part of what we do in Highland because our local members live, you know, in the communities that they serve and they're, they're very visible and very similar to what Darren was saying, actually. You know, there is nowhere to hide in Highland when you go and buy a pint of milk, three people are asking you about their constituency matters. So we have both um, online surveys plus face-to-face -face, um uh, and, and plus, uh, we involve our communities in what's called local place planning, which is led by community groups supported by the council. And then those local community place plans are what is meant to drive the, the spending priorities for that area. Now, there's never enough money to go to do everything that people want. But what it does mean is if you're making choices between spending, plan, uh, uh, spending um, requirements, you're prioritizing one area, housing over the provision of public conveniences or in another area you would prioritize providing you know clean streets and and and, and versus a school facility in another so it does it does vary from one place to another um, but what's difficult is when you have to cut things or stop things because they're not a statutory responsibility and quite often they're the things that are actually closest to the community's hearts so what we're also trying to do is give um, provide opportunities for communities to take these assets over themselves. We've got a formal legal process called community asset transfer. And so in that way, communities, if they want to maintain a service that we can no longer afford to do and they don't have a statutory duty to, to provide it, they, they can step in and do it themselves. Thanks, Kate, for that. Kerry, I see you want to jump in there. Um, our Labor councillors are fairly strong with the view that they're elected to represent the community. So when it comes to the big moves in terms of budget, uh, we we don't engage. We do engage in design of open space and, and on a whole range of things. But the big picture moves, our councillors are firmly of a view that they're elected to make to do that job, basically. I just want to pick up on Darren's comment on uh, on housing. Um, we have, from time to time, the state government come to us and say, our oh, council, you must have surplus land. We want you to give up your surplus land for 
this housing problem that we've got. And my very blunt response to state bureaucrats who come and knock on my door is, when you take away our rate pegging and allow us to be determinative of the rates that we will ask the community for and the services we will deliver, then I'll talk to you about free land. But otherwise, it's a state responsibility. So you use your budget to fix it and don't ask us to loaf on my budget. Very interesting uh, perspective. Thank you very much, Kerry. I think there's another topic there, Catherine, that we could do a panel on around that uh, that issue of councillors and where does the consultation need to start and end? Oh, absolutely. I had so many more questions too, and I know we've run out of time. I wanted to um, ask Kate about, you know, how local government is advocating to the national government about the measures it uses for to determine funding, but I know we haven't got time to go into that. Tonight, I can see a question in the chat there from uh, Peter, which is an excellent question around, you know, the, the, the sort of post-COVID effects and opportunities from there. And also, I think there's a discussion about potentially, you know, is there some risks for local government as well as the positives and opportunities, but is there also risks for local government in, in venturing into uh, what would be traditionally determined as non-sort of core business activities and having to actually rebuild workforces around these new um, new businesses. Um, but I think, Chris, you, we have run out of time. Um, I really did want to thank uh, all of our panellists tonight for making and this morning for making their, their time available and sharing those insights with us. This is certainly a topic that we need to continue talking about. I think we need to work together as local governments to be advocating quite strongly to state or national governments or federal governments, however we might refer to them, about the way in which they fund the local government sector, who is in fact delivering hundreds, if not close to thousands of services on behalf of you know, state and federal governments and yet are not being adequately funded to do so and where those uh, next level governments are actually shifting significant costs onto the sector and just creating an almost impossible situation in some places. Um, for those of you in the room who don't know, the Victorian Local Governance Association is an organisation that supports um, uh, effective, well, it's an independent organisation that supports councils and councils in good governance. So we work predominantly in Victoria, but also across Australia and also internationally through our partnerships, such as the one that you've been part of tonight. I, I really do thank all of you for your attendance. And Chris, I'll hand back over to you to wrap up. Thank you very much, Catherine. It is a shame we've run out of time. I think we need a part two because, as you say, there's a few questions there that have gone unanswered and, and maybe we need to come back and start to talk about what are the solutions as people see it and try and explore that uh, a bit further. But that just leaves us to thank our panel and I'll do it uh, one by one. Thank you very much to Kerry Robinson, OAM at uh, the City of Blacktown in Sydney. Terrific, Kerry, to have you. Uh, Darren Fuzzard at Mount Alexander Shire in uh, Victoria. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Sean O'Riordan in uh, Ireland, where everybody now wants to move. Even Jim McGee, who came here from Ireland, now is seriously thinking, I think, of going back after your presentation. Thank you, uh, Sean, and thanks for being here, uh, Jim. Jim's been very active just, just on this issue. Just one joke for housing. <laughs> right. Jim's been very active and showing leadership on the issue of the financial sustainability of the sector and the need for some serious solutions. And I know he's speaking tomorrow at the MAV State Council on that very topic. So go well there, uh, Jim, and thanks for your leadership. And Kate Lackey, the Interim CEO at Highland Council, terrific to meet you and to have your presentation this evening, Kate. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, and Jonathan Carr West, of course, uh, the CEO of LGIU, and interesting to hear about that research, which I'm sure Jonathan will be happy to tell you more about if you'd like to know more. Thank you all very much for being part of the session. It has been recorded. It will be made available to members of the VLGA and LGIU. Keep an eye on the VLGA Connect channel on YouTube, as always, for interesting interviews and topics. We've got quite a lot coming to you in the next uh, few weeks, and we hope you can enjoy that with us as as well. Thank you, Catherine, to you and the team at the VLGA for the assistance in uh, in uh, putting this on. And of course, the team at LGIU, Simone, and uh, everyone who's helped there. That's always greatly appreciated too.
And thank you, the audience, for being here. And with that, we'll say uh, good night and see you next time.